Hello and welcome back to the latest episode of the Massive Known Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Murphy, from the county of Cavan. Just wanted to get it out there quick. Uh, Ulster Champions 2020. Uh, this jersey's been worn a lot. This is not like the second time I've ever worn it. <laughs> uh, I, I wore it last year. To the, I, I did go to the final last year, the Ulster final last year, so I did wear it then. But uh, I just want to you know, rep them because that was an incredible win yesterday. Uh, no one saw that coming, including myself. So um, shout out to Calvin. But joined by Westy and Sam, not to talk about Gaelic football because them two boys wouldn't know a Gaelic football if it slapped them in the mouth. We have we have Mayo, Dublin, and Calvin here. So Sam's Absolutely. from That's Dublin it. now. Apparently, uh, we who knew? Who knew? <laughs> now that we're playing them, uh, he's, he's <laughs> piping up. He's piping up. And Westy is from uh, obviously. Balna in Mayo, who Westy was. There's also yes. Balna and Tipperary in they one as well. So yeah. there's also Balna and Cavan. So but it's, uh, hey. it's, quite, it's quite unfair on Cavan now because the majority of people from Cavan won't be able to count as high as the score difference between Dublin and Cavan. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, the stereotype is that we're cheap, not stupid. Okay, I just want to put that out there. Okay, we can count. Okay, hey. it's been a while, but yeah. Um, I have seen a, a meme going around, and I won't get into too graphic, but anyone who gets it will get it, and it'll be funny. But it's five black gentlemen uh, surrounding this tiny white girl, uh, and the five black gentlemen are labeled the dubs, and the small <laughs> white girl is labeled Cavan. <laughs> uh, so anyone who sees that will get it, but it's I probably saw, going to be fairly accurate to what's going to happen. But I we'll saw see. on it. I saw on Twitter this morning, it was like, there won't be a tea bag hung on the washing line. Yeah, oh. right? <laughs> all, all the funny jokes been sent to me on WhatsApp the last two days. And quite frankly, it's racist and I don't appreciate it. Yeah, so stop it. Says the guy just made a joke about four black men and a white women. You called us. That's racist. it. Was it's a it's more of a it's a porn joke, Westy. Okay, it's a porn joke. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know about those kind of things. I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm a yeah, good sorry. Christian. I forgot that you're, yeah, you're celibate. Um, we're not here to talk. We're not here to talk about Not by gaming. choice. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're here to talk about some rugby. Uh, we don't really want to talk about it, probably, because it was a pretty bored day for Ireland, but we'll get stuck into it. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about other games as well, but we're mainly going to talk about Ireland and England. Um, Saturday at 3 o'clock, we all got to watch the game. And it was a strange one, because I, I watched it back today, and we weren't... We weren't in this game, really. Do you know what I mean? We were, we were definitely sort of bullied around the pitch a lot. But at the same time, looking back, the only, England only scored two tries, one of which was incredibly easy to prevent. Like, if you were going playing it again, it wouldn't happen. The line didn't work. Chris Farrell misses a tackle. Bundy should have covered, according to Jamie Heaslip. But, but we'll I don't know what game he's watching. Like. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking into that. But, you know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, doesn't happen every game. But at the same time, England were... Miles, the better team. So we'll, we'll get kind of into it at the moment. But Westy, kind of, do you, do you do you see where I'm coming from? It's a it was a weird game to watch back. Uh, I do, yeah. But I mean, I, I mean, you seem to be optimistic about it. I'm I'm kind of more pessimistic. Not really. About it, like, no, no. I just um, no, I'm never optimistic. But England didn't like didn't need. To, we talked about like the Crusaders in the in Super Rugby Aotearoa. Like England didn't need to get out of third gear to beat us. Like they didn't. They didn't want the ball. They were. They knew we were no attacking threat. They were happy to give us the ball. And what about they have two hundred and thirty something odd tackles? Yeah, yeah. made two hundred and thirty of them. Like it's. I think they were using this almost as an exercise in defence. Um, they were happy enough to give us the ball and see what we were going to do. We were kind of exciting with the ball for the first ten minutes, and then we reverted back to our pick and go one up runners. Um, and we were knocked back the pitch because we can't match them physically. So I don't know why our game plan was to try and do that again. So is that is is this? I was trying to like lay blame where where to lay the blame. It, it seems to be a lot of it possibly was coaching because the game plan seemed to be trying to match them physically, which we all know from previous counters that isn't going to happen. No, and any time we were anyway exciting with the ball it was uh, either when we tried switch moves or when we kicked in behind, like for Billy Burns or uh, for Jack. Uh, Jacob Stockdale's try lovely little kick over the top from Billy Burns into space and he gets it same with the Farrell held up over the line like that was one of by my count two maybe three times we had advantage inside the 22 that we tried something other than mm. quick uh, quick pass like it was ridiculous because if you look back at the structure like that line speed leaves space in behind and yeah sure they've got like more than capable back three that can get into that space and cover but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be pushing it in if we keep pushing into that space that'll slow down their line they'll have to start thinking about covering it yeah and it's 
you know, this is what England do. They they put the ball in areas, and you know, if the opposition makes a mistake, then brilliant. We we never really asked that question of England. Uh, and you know, you mentioned the tackles. We also had what seventy two percent territory. Like looking at the stats, you would think that we hockeyed England just by like the the actual stat without the scoreline. It was incredible. But Sam, what did you think? Yeah, I thought for for England, it was actually quite a similar game to their game against Georgia the week before, whereby you know. I know the score against Georgia the week before ended up being like 40 nil, but for a good majority of that game, it was quite close on the scoreboard. It was seven nil for like half an hour, even though England were dominant. They were winning every collision. They were completely nullifying Georgia. And that happened with us as well. Like Wesley said, we came out the traps, tried something for about five, 10 minutes. And then I don't know, was it a tactical decision to revert back to the tried and tested and rarely working these days forward kind of play, narrow channel play? Or did that just happen organically when the other stuff wasn't working for us? Uh, but it was a shame to watch because like, I, I can't stand the idea that Ireland think they're going to beat England between the Rook and the Ten in any sort of battle or competition. Like, you can get a little bit of go for Porter or Healy or you know, Ryan can carry quite well, Peter Matthew and uh, Standard can carry quite well, but you're not going to do it relentlessly. You're not going to beat the likes of Toji or Underhill or Curry after three, four phases, they're going to get the upper hand on you. And that's what that's what kind of forces us back into this this boring sort of play. So it was disappointing uh, from an Irish point of view to see it. It, it looked like there was a lack of imagination there. Uh, I, I, I reserve any judgment on Farrell. I don't think this is ever going to be an easy game. You know, England didn't get out of second gear and probably got a very beneficial tackling drill done where they get 270 odd tackles or whatever it was in the, in the in the entire game so for them it's hugely beneficial for Ireland it's done nothing for the confidence playing against England but you know Farrell's got a long time to go as the, the coach and there's one or two little bright sparks like I did think Chris Farrell was good uh, you know he, he made he made kind of a bit of ground outside every once in a while when he did get the ball at least if he went wide and he got that little no John there was potential there you know Earl's break I thought Keenan was just a rush of blood to the head and a really, really poor mistake to be in that channel. A forward with a bit of cop on should have grabbed him, thrown him out of the way and said, not a chance, let us reset and then go wide. But he went first receiver and got himself isolated. So there was a few small mistakes like that. You know, the one-on-one for the try, for the, the cross field kick on the advantage. You're not going to win that. That's the advantage to English man. So, you know, fair play to him. That's a good try. You know, you can't really say much more than there was a few little bright spark moments. But on the whole, it was... Yeah, it was dominant English display. They didn't really capitalize on the possession or on their on their their like dominance. They uh, they kind of let Ireland play with the ball and just let them wear themselves out. I was disappointed that we didn't take a few penalties uh, just to even move the scoreboard a little bit because the, the, even putting three points on just stirs a bit of momentum, just puts doubt in people's minds or just motivates people a little bit. We went to the corner a couple of times and didn't see the point and our lineup wasn't functioning anyway. Be that the throwing, be that the calling, be that the jumping, I don't know. I want to put the blame on one individual. I think it was just farcical overall, to be, to be honest. But yeah, I would have liked to have seen a few kicks, even if they weren't the easiest kicks, just to try and get the, the scoreboard taken a little bit. But you know, yeah, it they, happened in England. England were World Cup favourites last year in the final. Probably didn't do their show their best in the final, but you know they they've been a dominant team for a few years and they've been developing. And Eddie Jones is probably top two, three coaches in the world. So I don't know how you're going to compete with an England team like that in the situation we're in at the moment. So the fact there was only 11 points in it is probably a little bit of a positive to take. Well, this I watched it back today. I think definitely they didn't bully us going with like going forward with the ball like they did in previous games. Like defensively, I thought we, we actually showed up a decent bit. Like we didn't get bullied. We, we conceded 18 points. Like I said, one of the tries was... Just incredible play from Johnny May, and it was more arm mistake than you know good from England. It was offensively where again we looked clueless. We looked like we never tried to get the ball out wide. When we did, there was no overlap. You know, we we took the ball. I'm sick of seeing Irish forwards taking the ball either standing still yeah. or, or like not running at speed. Like if someone's if you're gonna meet a a, a quick line, a defensive line, meeting them fast with big with your big forwards, you know, it's gonna take a lot of energy out of these boys and like. It's weird, like a couple of games, like CJ Stander was anonymous, which is not very, we don't say that very often when it comes to an Irish team. Um, our forwards didn't really get any traction at all. Quinn Rue had a tough day at the office. James Ryan, who is, you know, a, a world-class lock, and he just, he's coming up against probably the best lock in the world in Mario Toja. And 
there's not much you can do about that, unfortunately. But what I what I really disappointed me was England looked like the team that hadn't won the three previous occasions against us. They looked so much more up for it. They so, looked so much more uh, pumped for that game than we did. And we should be the ones going in there with something to prove. It doesn't look like that. Like the amount of times the, the camera would cut away to Johnny May after someone, uh, you know, Sam Underhill t- got a turnover and he's celebrating like he just scored a try. And it's, you know, small stuff like that that this English team have that we just don't seem to have. And I'm like, we know, and it's happened the last few games, we know what England are good at and what they're going to do. And we still don't have, well, A, an answer for it and B, a different idea of how to stop it. We know that they're incredible jackal threats and we still are slow to get to a man carrying the ball and cleaning out a threat. And like, it, like I watched it back and the amount of times that one English player requires four Irish lads to get him off the ball and you're leaving yourself at such a deficit when it comes to numbers. It's incredible. And I, I don't know how you combat that, just try and get there quicker, but I assume that's going to be talked about during the week when it comes to coaching that, that that's, that has to be a tactic. That's something that, yeah, yeah, I noticed that with Ireland a couple of times recently is uh, players getting themselves isolated, even off, you know, even off that slow ball that they take. Sometimes there's not a pod. Sometimes it's single men and they're waiting for like an, an arriving pod to come about 10 seconds later. Like, I don't know how it's coached, but from my gathering of seeing forwards, and Wesley, you could probably tell me a bit more and Smurf as well. Like my gathering of forwards, it tends to be you're working in threes and you're standing right beside each other. One man's taking it, the other two are going over. But I've seen Ireland a couple of times taking it around the corner, taking it straight from the back of the rook forwards, completely on their own. And then it happened again, like with the forwards and backs, uh, at the weekend, so I don't know, is that is that on purpose? Are they looking to get it out the back door, give an option, not commit too many to men for it? But like you said, England were, like, they were jackling all over it straight away, and that being isolated, like, if you're going in in a two, you instantly have someone going over, protecting it, but it just didn't happen at the weekend, so it was disappointing. Just on uh, the other point you were saying, Smurf, we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, but England celebrating uh, every momentous little... Thing. And I don't think you were a fan of it. I was saying that I like the way Saracens do it. And I actually think it's been extremely beneficial to England and the English teams that do it in the fanless stadiums. Because I think they're creating a little atmosphere and they're building mm. each other up when the fans aren't. Because you look at like the likes of Atoje screaming in like when they, and it was probably not actually the right call, but when they won a turnover and he's screaming and he's celebrating and stuff, I think that G's them up the way the crowd would normally. And that's something that they're used to doing because... Saracens are infamous for for celebrating everything and it's almost to the extent that you're rubbing it in the face of the opposition but I actually don't think they're doing it to rub it in the face I think they're doing it to G each other up and to kind of positively enforce the, the play and I thought that was quite evident the English fans or the English players like you said were they looked more up for it but they were keeping each other up for it whereas I don't think there was really much motivation throughout that Irish team I couldn't see too much like celebrating for big things that happened or and or kind of g each other up and i think the players like ross Byrne and gibson park probably needed that they probably needed a bit more cushion from their friends from their mates when it wasn't going their way because it was a it was a horrible situation to be in in like your first time playing england for gibson park and one of your first big starts you know for ross Byrne, they really needed that motivation and that kind of backing and i don't think that they got it i think it was kind of a quite a lonely place for them at the weekend yeah, Westy, what do you think? So Gibson Park's coming under a lot of heat and, you know, rightly so. It was a poor day at the office. He, you know, they were obviously were going with a, a kicking tactic when it came to him, a lot of over-the-top kicks, and they just weren't executed correctly. Um, do you think it's fair, the kind of heat he's coming under? Um, I, I think, again, like I think Sam said earlier, like, you can't blame one player. Like, there's a systematic failure. There's a problem in a game plan. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, think, I, don't, I don't think you can lay too much blame on Gibson Park it's only his second start like um, it was always going to be a tough game for him I thought you know I, I, I thought at least he was trying you know he was trying little snipes around the, the rock we, we did seem to be running more of a nine centric game than, a, than our, our usual off our ten without, without Johnny Sexton so I think there's that added layer of pressure on them because it's you know it's his decision making now that's under under scrutiny as opposed to you know we normally look at Johnny Sexton being the one kind of you know calling the line and kind of giving people their marching orders. Um, I, I don't think it's like, I, I, like again, and we, we did, we did improve a little bit when Conor Murray came on. Um, but I, one of the things that I thought was strange was we did seem to go back to what we were lambasting Murray for, which was the old kind of aimless box kicking methodology. Mm. Like 
again, the, the, the first kind of one or two outings for Gibson Park, we saw in box kick, but they were real contestable, real chases, whereas it was falling back on, okay, we've, we've, our forwards have carried five times now, we've gone nowhere. All right, let's box kick and hope for the best. Like, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's fair to blame it all on, on Gibson Park, but um, again, like, the contrast come back to like, what would Cooney have done? Do you know, like what would maybe Kieran Marmion have been like in that same position? So I don't know. I just don't think my main criticism of Gibson Park would be, I don't think he offers anything that Cooney and Marmion don't. And maybe think, we saw that a bit better in this game. Yeah, I think, again, I come back to coaching. If you're going to try that kicking game, I don't think Gibson Park is the scrum half to go for. That's not his strengths. His strengths is, as we saw against Wales, it's pushing tempo, quick pace, quick every Like when it's when the forward pack is doing well, obviously scrum half's job's a lot easier. But against Wales, you know, it was ideal for his game style, or his playing style. Um, so getting him in to do those kind of, yeah, as you said, aimless box kicks or maybe kicking, you know, into certain areas, that's not maybe his strength and he doesn't maybe, you know, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, and I'm not necessarily the biggest Murray fan, but if that's the game, so you're going to play and maybe go with Murray or go with someone. But I, I want to touch on, you made a point because a lot of obviously Connick fans have been saying, you know, Marmion um, would have done a lot better in that game. Is it a case of, yes, there was poor selection or poor system or is it a case of England were just so dominant when it came to that game that, any scrum half was going to struggle. Yeah, I think... Sorry, I just... Uh, I think any scrum half would struggle. I think that... I, I don't have any qualms with Gibson Park being picked. I think he's a very good scrum half. I've been saying I'd be a hypocrite to come out now and say he never should have because last week, if you listen back, I said, yeah, no, it's great to see him co- coming in. He's played well. He deserves a spot after the Wales performance. And yeah, like Wesley said, maybe it was more of a nine-centric game. I don't know. Does that come from the fact that uh, Ross Byrne was extremely deep and extremely static and I don't know is that Ross Byrne's type of play when he's starting like that or is that a tactical decision to let Gibson Park have a bit more of it and let Ross Byrne kind of be more of a link man deep uh, whatever it was I don't think it worked I'd like to see and I'm not going to just come in and be a conic biased head so I'm not saying I'd like to see Gibson Park starting with Ireland with Jack Carty but if Gibson Park was to start with Ireland with a Jack Carty style player a Danny Cipriani style player a Billy Burns style player, someone that's a little bit more exciting maybe than what Ross Byrne gave us at the weekend. Uh, you know, kind of a sexton of a few years ago where he's playing very on the edge of the game line. That might be more in tune with what Gibson Park is good at, which is delivering quick ball, recycling it quickly. Uh, I don't think he's a weak kicker. I just don't think he's the same type of kicker as Connor Murray. Like that, like you were saying, high contestable ones, which England are so good and have been so good at just shepherding you away from being able to contest. What Gibson Park's kicking was very good in, in the last two games in the start and then when he was a substitute was he was getting these low trajectory quick ones like almost a quick recycled ball he was doing the same thing so I don't think there's much blame you can really put on Gibson Park uh, from a personal point of view yeah I, I'm fine with Gibson Park being picked I don't have a problem with that I don't think we can retrospectively go back on what we all said last week or what a lot of people were saying last week regardless of what they want to say they were saying on Twitter but I do think that Marmion is probably, and I, I, I will, I'll say that I'm confident I would have said this last week as well. I think Marmion is probably the same style of player as Gibson Park, probably a little bit more reliable and definitely a little bit more experienced. So I would like to see Marmion in that situation, even if it was to help the experience of bringing Ross Byrne into the game a bit more. Because I think the Gibson Park, you know, his game plan and Ross Byrne's just didn't seem to really mesh very well. Uh, Byrne was very deep and very static and Gibson Park, it's, we we praised for being quick so I don't know if, if that was a conflict of kind of styles but what do you think Westy? No look I, I didn't mean to say that like I, I, I was happy to see Gibson Park start against England um, I just kind of think we've got a deeper profile of him now and as Sam said I don't think I don't think he goes well with whatever type of game like we seem to be playing a kicking kind of territory game plan that that fell apart quite easily and I, like is Gibson Park the right man for that? No like I don't think so. I think he is more like, as Sam said, and maybe things that Cooney is very good as well, which is low trajectory, quick kicks uh, into space. You know, like we're kicking high to the likes of Johnny May. Like it's not really <laughs> going to help. Like and the he, best counter-attacking rugby player on the planet at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> He's ridiculous. I, like. It should have been. And I, I said it earlier, we, we saw it with, you know, with Gibson Park when we did do it, when we did put a little grubber through. Now we, we, 
might have tried it once or twice and it didn't work. But when there was space and we put a grubber through with advantage, like we were getting in behind them. So I don't think I don't I don't blame Gibson Park. I, I kind of blame the direction he was given. Um, and then as Sam said, Sam made a really good point. I just don't think maybe maybe his style didn't mesh well with Ross Byrne on the day. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know a lot of the two of them together from Leinster. I don't know if they're better for Leinster week in, week out. They're, probably they're, definitely, they're definitely better for Leinster. Like, I've watched them play together for Leinster because, like, you know, Ross Byrne is essentially the starting out half for Leinster most of the time. Like, you know, he plays a lot more than Sexton does. But they're in these games that we're now, like, it's becoming a big narrative now how weak the league is. Mm. Partially, part of the weakness of the league regardless of what the Leinster fans want to say, is because of how dominant Leinster are. It's making it not competitive for everyone else. It's making it less important. People are resting players. People aren't going out and trying against Leinster, which is meaning that Gibson Park and Ross Byrne are let to do whatever the heck they want 99% of the time in the league, which isn't beneficial for them when they go in to play for the fifth or sixth best country in the world. You know, they're not the best the way they are at Leinster, which means they're under pressure, which means they don't have the time and space they do for Leinster. So, you know, is, this is a conversation for another day, but maybe sharing the wealth and improving the teams around them would get their players more experience of being under the cash every once in a while. Because, like, I've seen Ross Byrne play with Gibson Park, and they don't play like that. He was he was very sheepish, Ross Byrne. He was very mm-hmm. deep, and he was very static. And I don't know, was that a tactical thing told to him by a coach to protect him, or was that something that he did because he didn't feel up for it? But whatever it was, it didn't work, and it allowed England to use the quickest defensive line and just absolutely destroys. You couldn't get anyone like, you know, the likes of Earls or Bundy or Farrell on the ball at wide at all because England were just up in our faces. And like you said, Smurf, they were hitting and Jacqueline and we were, we were going back. We were going nowhere. We were going side to side and it was just, it was no invention and that, that came from having no platform. Yeah, it's look. We'll talk about what England did well. Okay, England were incredible defensively. We also, we we just we spoke already about how incredible they are. They are a top three team in the in the world. There's no doubt about that. At least, uh, and you know you're not going to beat them too often. I think it, what's annoying as an Ireland fan is how we go about these games and how we seem to not learn from our mistakes and change stuff like. It is annoying, Wesley. As you said, we we tried a couple of grubbers and a couple of kicks over the top, but it's always when we have advantage. Why aren't we trying that in open play sometimes? Like this is, you're doing the same thing over and over again and the door is getting absolutely slammed shut in your face and we just keep going back for more punishment and it's just not going to work. So why aren't we trying this? Like the first, as you said earlier on again, West, the first 10 minutes we looked dangerous. You know what I mean? We made a nice couple of breaks. You know, we tried a crossfield kick uh, to Lowe, but it, it, Lowe wasn't on the same page as, as Ross Barr at the time. But we, we looked like we were trying stuff and, we looked as if we could actually compete with them at that stage. Uh, and it just seemed to fall off. I don't know why England obviously are very good at creating momentum for themselves and taking momentum away from us um, with a well-timed jackal. And look, and again, people are getting annoyed at England sometimes when they, you know, they definitely are offside sometimes. They definitely get away with stuff sometimes. But that's what all great teams do. Like you, you talk about Richie McCaw, half the time people say he got away with murder all the time. Like, that's what they say about him as well as being a great player. Maro Otoja is the exact same. He walks that line every game, but half the time it works and he's incredibly effective for England. And I wish we don't have, and I said this to one of the lads at work, I was like, we don't have any real bastards. And I mean that in a, in a good way, like an affectionate way. Like O'Mahony's our closest thing to it, but we don't have a Maro Otoja who will be a bit of an asshole or be a bit of a dick and kind of walk that line. We don't have that in Ireland for some reason. Like Lowe came in and he kind of is on the verge of it, but it's we kind of want a forward who's like that. And I think James Ryan is our best chance of it. Um, speaking of James Ryan, what do we think of his captaincy? Do we think he put enough pressure on the referee when it came to that breakdown to try and get in his face? Because uh, we, we know the French referees aren't the best when it comes to the breakdown. Uh, England capitalised on that. I don't feel like we did. So what are we, uh, Westy, what are we giving... Uh, James Ryan's first I know it's his first day but uh, how we uh, uh, rating out of 10 maybe how give us one of those um, I'd probably go with about a 6 I I don't think he had his best game in an Ireland jersey first off which is rare like I've I don't really know if I've ever really criticised him mm. um, only thing I've ever said about him is that he, he'll grow into a better player um, yeah no I don't think it was his best performance in Ireland jersey I don't know mate Maybe I, I misremember. I, I don't remember him being overly in the refs here. I don't remember him really talking to the ref too much. No. Um, 
it's his first time out. It's a high pressure game. We did well, relatively. You know, we didn't have players sent off. We weren't. We never got, as far as I remember, didn't get any massive verbal warnings about you know next infringements or stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I'd go with six, and I think I'd be a little bit generous with that. Yeah, Sam, what do you think? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree, Wes. You like a five or a six? I don't think he did anything particularly wrong as captain. I don't think he did anything particularly right as captain. Like there was nothing, no standout moment where you know he could see he was getting in the ref's ear and doing it. But I will, in his defence, say impossible situation when your team is being beaten that badly to not to go up and try and try and like if you go up and try and highlight something that's happening in the breakdown a ref's going to turn around and go we'll stop being crap at the breakdown like you know they were being dominated they're being dominated so much that the few times that there was an infringement it was just falling into the pattern of ireland losing the breakdown you know there was infringements not every time there was infringements every once in a while but you can't lose three and then the fourth one be an infringement and be like eh, we lost that because of an infringement like you know win it and then start highlighting those things. I think, you know, from, from him, it's a lose-lose situation. Like, your, your captain on a losing team is being dominated. You can't go over and start, because you'll just get a name for being a whiny little bitch then. Like, so, yeah, I, think, yeah, yeah. I think, as a captain, I don't think anything wrong with what he did. I'm, I'm sure, like, you know, motivation-wise, he's probably okay. I'd like to see, personally, because I, like, I appreciate the player, I'd like to see more of, like, you know, an English-style motivator, as a captain, someone that really G's you up, not someone that spends their time getting in the ear of the ref, you know, does it when it needs to be done, like Rory Best was good at talking to refs, that's something he's like, you know, uh, lauded for, but, you know, that's one element of being a captain. What I would prefer is when you're only 11 points down in a game, you should be 40 points down, grabbing everyone by the scruff of the neck and dragging them up for the last 10 minutes and pushing it on, like, and I didn't see that happen. I didn't see a last ditch push, you know, the Stockdale try is a good try, but it's, it's something out of nothing. Like I would have liked to see a real like team effort to push on and get back into it with ten minutes to go. But I think they kind of just they were getting towards the end of it and it was that was fine. Like that for me was I would have liked to have seen more of that from him. But you know, he has plenty more opportunities to do it and I'm I'm sure he will be a very good captain. By all accounts he's a great player and seems like a good bloke. So like I don't I don't think you can judge his captaincy on that game. It's fine debut, it's grand. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I, I noticed that after the game, when I seen the interviews by James Ryan and Andy Farrell, we don't seem, we're not pissed off by this. Like as a team, we're not, there's no one, no one getting angry. And I know, Wesley, don't pull that face. I know <laughs> what you're going to say, but I, I get that. You're a professional player. You're trying to, this, you're all media trained. I get that. But sometimes it's, it's nice to see being like, you know what, I'm pissed off we lost that game and we got absolutely manhandled. So I propose this. Hear me out. We bring in Michael Cheka as an anger consultant. <laughs> Clearly works for the Irish idiots, isn't it? Yeah, just get him in for a couple of weeks, just to shout at people, get them riled up, and let's play England again. I'm a genius. Bring me in. It's all no, but see, I, I would I, like. I don't think. I don't think the reaction was anger. See, so like I'd go back to kind of like how many times were we camped inside their twenty-two and we were denied on the line? Like you know, we kind of. I think I think I think we were broken. I I think we were disheartened. I think everyone was just you know I think we just had a really low ebb after the game as opposed to having the anger and frustration that we probably should have had, and that probably comes back to as well like situations like that. Paul O'Connell would pick people up and fight, but I think maybe James Ryan was getting disheartened and frustrated by the amount of times we were so close to the line and couldn't take anything from it. Yeah, you look at what their measurables were before the game, though. They might be not angry and disheartened because they might have gone into the game with a kind of set few goals. Like, I know you're never going to go into a game saying, we're not aiming to win this. That's not how sport works. But you do have realistic ideas of what you want out of a game or out of a tournament or out of a first couple of matches as a coach. And, you know, from where from where they're standing, you know, was it debut a few people, try out Ross Byrne in a 10-12 partnership with Bundy? you know, have James Ryan make his first cap, like bring in some players. Like these are their measurables, the things that they're, maybe they're looking for. So maybe they're not overly disheartened with the result because you're going into an England team that like absolutely manhandled the All Blacks a couple of months ago in the World Cup semi-final. Like, so, you know, maybe they went in going, do these things and I'll be happy regardless of the result, you know, and that that's hard for us to take as passionate fans sitting here without that knowledge. But maybe that's why they're not overly vocally angry on post-match interviews because they in their heads know that they've done what they set out to do. It's worth think, mentioning as well, like, as Sam now, it was more than a couple months ago, Sam, it was about 13 months ago. Um, 
<laughs> when was COVID, man? It's COVID. When was the World Cup? Was it not like... That's October. October, last November. October, yeah. Was it? Oh, my yeah, God. The final was about... It was, yeah, I think it was it's about... at least a year ago, years. but... Uh, yeah, I, I, still, details. Uh, I still... It's still, to me, it's still only like... March or April now at this <laughs> yeah, yeah. In my head, I'm still in Japan. I never left. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's worth mentioning as well. Like, uh, first off, this is better than uh, first half of the year. You know, it's just not a great consolation to have, but it, it was better. Um, and it's worth mentioning, like, England are coming off a World Cup that they'll feel like they, they could have won. And, they, you know, they've got a good system in place. They haven't made too many changes in terms of squad. Like, they're kind of, they have their platform and they're building. You know, they're trying to improve now again for the next cycle. Whereas we are under a whole new system. And, and again, as Sam kind of highlights, the last year doesn't really count. Like everyone still thinks it's, it's, it's March and April, you know? And that goes for Andy Farrell with the squad. He hasn't had the year it looks like he's had. Now, I know he's coming in from an old system, um, but that system had to, I think that system was planned to be kept and now it's been changed to abandon it. Um, so he hasn't really had as much time with the players as you think he does. So as Sam said, maybe it's just trying to build more into a certain game plan. Maybe we had other deliverables that we're not aware of that have been succeeded. I think we need to do this. And Sam, you might be able to back me up on this, but from my brief experience in Turds Rugby, there was <laughs> a, a forward from New Zealand. I'm not going to name names, but they suggested the idea that there would be a keyword shout at some stage throughout the game and that they would punch someone from the opposition team. <laughs> I think Ireland need That's- to do this. That's the old Lions 99 call, isn't it? Uh, yeah, Willie whatever. John, yeah, sure. Willie John McBride, I think, was, uh, I think it's 99 or 49 or something. Some number Willie John where, definitely didn't where, play. Not 99. <laughs> no, no, Sam, no. Sam, your not, dates not, not, time, not from yeah. 99. The, the call was he'd shout 99 on the oh, pitch and right. we'll start bashing the head off people. Yeah, that was that was a, it's, a like that, it's like that scene in Semi Pro. Semi Pro. They yeah, cut yeah. the answer. Somebody hit somebody. Oh, yeah. Or that's, in a, that's the key word, Wesley. Somebody in hit the somebody. Long, in the longest yard when they just absolutely bait the crap out of them on the first play, and Adam Sandler brings him in. He's like, okay, now that's over. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a strategically placed strategically placed punch in the face might rile a couple of lads up. I think we could do with a bit of a kick up the hole sometimes. Again, oh, Andy Farrell, call me. I'm always available for these nuggets of information. <laughs> uh, I want to bring up uh, Hugo Keenan because I'm seeing a very contrasting uh, reviews on his performance because obviously with the Johnny May try, he, he under jumps it. He d- doesn't time it very well. I think James Lowe should have been out there personally, but whatever. He, f- he found himself out in the wing and he, he didn't do a great job uh, you know, contesting that. He also let one drop in the first few minutes that was very catchable. I have to say, though, I was extremely impressed by how he responded to that. You know, he, he caught in the next couple of balls. He never looked he, did, he never looked like he lost his confidence when, with the ball or attacking it. He definitely didn't have a good game in regards, you know, his kicking was pretty poor. Um, that obviously two mistakes, one led to a try. I'm not saying that he had a good game, but I have, I've seen several of the players would have totally lost the head there and dropped the head and made more mistakes and let the mistakes compile upon each other. And he didn't do that. And I have to say, that impressed me more so than, you know, I can forgive a bad day, don't get me wrong, everyone has them. But to respond like that shows me a, a, a great mental strength that, you know, this guy is confident in himself and he, he, doesn't, he, you know, he doesn't let the, the mistake bother him. Am I reading into that wrong or did you see that too? I was impressed with his confidence. Uh, one or two mistakes, you know, nothing major, not much more than what Stockdale did. I think he gets away, like two weeks ago, I think he gets away with it more because he's uh, just newer to the position in term, or new, newer, like in the Irish setup. I think you, you get a little bit more grace when you're playing your second or third game, you know, especially if you scored tri- two tries in your first one two games ago. Uh, so I like, I, I, I was happy enough with it. I think it'd be very unfair to say he had any chance in that. Uh, contestable put through for the crossfield kick like he's you know he's going up against a man who's got a running jump and is aware of what's happening low probably you say should have been out there yeah he probably should have maybe got sucked in maybe that's tactical we've seen ourselves included criticism of our defense being pulled dragged in pulled in sucked in too many times maybe that is like maybe that's the thing they chose to do and have low right in there leave Keenan out on the wing and uh you know, he was always going to be out-jumped. It's, it's an extremely hard defensive position to be in uh, contesting against someone who's got a running jump on you like that. So I wouldn't put any blame on that. The kicks, yeah, a couple of poor kicks. But overall, happy out. And, like, I'm, I'm happy to see him play again and the next time prove himself again and grow into it. Uh, if he keeps playing the way he's playing and growing into it, 
you know, I'd be happy with that. Yeah, my point though, sorry, before we get to Westy, my point with the, the responding, like Stockdale, like in that France game, errors led to more errors. Yeah. You know I mean? and we, one thing you can say about Stockdale the last few weeks is that, geez, he looks confident. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he, I think he, he definitely has a lot of self-belief. Like, sorry, I, I went off on a tangent and forgot to answer your point. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like he, uh, he definitely has a lot more self-belief than like other players might. Uh, Stockdale is, it's not just the one or two mistakes that affected him. He's, it's, build up for a couple of months now of criticism coming from all sorts and that's probably affecting him negatively mental health and all that but I think Keenan is fresh he's coming off the back of some fairly good form provincially decent displays in his early Irish career and then you know he's he's kind of able to compartmentalize those mistakes and show good character to not let them get him down and continue playing his game and take some high balls after a drop so yeah, happy with that. And if he if that's the confidence he has and he can maintain that confidence going into an even rougher patch of form, you know, a couple of games worth of bad form, he's still confident back himself, great, because that's how good players come out of these sort of things. And that's why you think if Stockdale has good a good positive mentality about him, he'll come out of this form as well. If he's confident in himself, it, he'll get past the bad run of form. Well, that try could spark it back in them. But, Westy, what, yeah, how would you review Keenan's performance? Um, I... I thought all in all he was pretty decent. Um, yeah, like weren't any mistakes. Like the jump against Johnny May. Yeah, the, the Keenan's problem is he tries to jump across, and May just has a fantastic platform to go up for that ball. You have to keep in mind England had advantage as well, so that's a shot mm-hmm. to nothing. Um, I think he reacted well to a few early mistakes. Do I think he's, for lack of a better word, the next Rob Kearney? I'm not convinced, but I'm 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 also not disenchanted the way maybe I have been about Stockdale in the past, you know. I don't think, I don't think we found an out and out a fullback yet. But I think, I'm happy to give Keenan the opportunity to grow into the role mm. a little bit more. Now, I would like, if possible, I'd love to see Shane Daly get some time against yeah. Georgia. But, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with, with, with Keenan getting more game time at it because you have to look at them in, as to who, where they are, right? And maybe people were a little bit too, uh, kind of made a jump with, with Jacob Stockdale. But Jacob Stockdale burst on the scene and did really well. And we've seen the last few years, we've kind of seen him deteriorate in games, you know? And like that could be media, that could be his confidence been shook and all that, which is kind of, you know, I say, go back to the province and build your confidence. Um, but Hugh Hinnon is kind of the other side of that coin. Okay, the brilliant first game, little, you know, obviously after you have a good first game, other teams know you and they see you and they kind of mark you a bit better. But although he has one or two mistakes, he's still kind of developing and still getting a little bit better each time and seeming more comfortable in the jersey. So I am happy to, to give players time to grow into the jersey, um, but I wouldn't call off the search just yet. No, no I don't, we're not saying that either, definitely not. Um, I would I totally definitely agree. Not say, uh, I would, and it's a term I don't like, I would definitely not say that he has cemented a place. Uh, Cement, I, yeah. I get rid of that You term. love a good cemented place, Sam. I yeah. hate a cemented place. I think that it's the worst term ever, and it's one of the reasons why we as Ireland have failed miserably the last few years, is because players cement their place, and then they can't get uncemented when there's <laughs> cement's hard to break Sam it's hard yeah. to break so like, yeah. we just say yeah yeah, exactly like Wesley said let him continue to prove he's worth the jersey and then uh, every time he does he can get it the next time and that's fine yeah I just think I, I like the fact that he, he didn't let the previous mistakes kind of affect him like say Stockdale did against France I just like that and look I get you know the France game was a lot more pressure than that English game but I just like to see it. but we'll, we'll move on there's two other games that happened the weekend uh, we'll go, it was the Connick game. Connick game, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a, we beat Zebra. We're going to yeah, win, We're gonna win yeah. the league. Uh, I'll, we'll save the Connick talk because uh, a little plug here. I am having Dara Small on the podcast this Wednesday. Uh, Dara used to cover Connacht uh, a few years ago uh, and is fairly knowledgeable um, on, on Connacht. So we'll get we'll get deep in with, with, with uh, Connacht and that. Uh, no bias, though, hopefully, on like, these two clowns. No bias. Uh, no bias. I'm not biased. I just want 15 Connacht players to start for Ireland. Is that too <laughs> yeah. much to ask? It's too much to ask. Just, just on the bench. Just, Don't forget the bench. <laughs> I just want the 15 next week to show me it's a bad idea. And yeah, sure, yeah. They yeah, play the next game. It's like that meme. Have we uh, ever tried it? My mind. No. Yeah, yeah. Have we ever tried it? No. Have you ever won a World Cup? No. You know, I see a correlation yeah. there. I can't yeah. argue with that. I can't argue with that. Well, uh, we'll go to our man on the ground live. Just coming in here, 
beep, 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 beep. beep. We've got Westy in Georgia. Westy, how are you? <laughs> Going in Hi, Smurf. I'm it's, here in Tbilisi. It's um, West Billy, isn't it? There, I yeah. unfortunately because my information is wrong. The Georgian team are actually based in England at the moment, so there is no yeah. rugby here in Tbilisi. We, we flew you all the way to Georgia <laughs> for nothing. Yeah. Uh, Wales eighteen nil against Georgia. Uh, I didn't see this game. I was looking at the scoreline. I was like, you know what, Georgia must have been fairly competitive. But then I seen on Twitter that didn't seem to be the case. So Westy, give us your review. Um, they 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 they. they, they they had improved from the game before. They they actually were able to build a couple of phases. They looked decent ball in hand. Um, their kind of set piece continues to let them down. Like yeah, some, someone put in a statistic that, and please forgive me if I misquote it, but in the previous World Cup cycle, uh, they'd never given away a scrum penalty. Yeah. And now they've done it in every game since the World wow. Cup. Wow. Not sorry, not counting the uh, the European Rugby Championship, the second tier Six Nations. So against tier one sides, they never gave away scrum penalties, and now um, that seems to be happening. The fact they haven't scored a point is is worrying. Uh, they did miss a conversion just before half time. I think it's the only time they went to take the three points. So I do admire that in them as well. Like they they back themselves to go for the tries. It's it's just one or two little things that are coming off, and I I do think. I almost think they're going to be more dangerous against us because they have improved between the two games. Um, like, again, I've said it once, i say it again, their head coach hasn't even there for two months. And as far as I know, he has no coaching experience. He's a former player. Um, but again, if, if I'm wrong, somebody please tell me. Um, Wesley, yeah. this is your job to be right about this. Yeah. Okay? No one else can. Is that, I think David, David Humphreys was brought in on mm. a temporary basis as a consultant just to kind of... Like, but that was like as a favor to World Rugby. If I remember reading it right, he, he said that World Rugby approached him and said, you know, Georgia have an entirely new coaching ticket in place, but they're entering this tournament in the next few weeks, you know, and it's a good opportunity for them. Will you go in and just give them a little bit of a hand? So he's gone in recently enough, but there's, yeah, there's, there's not any long term planning gone into them, uh, which is just going to be very, very hard going into a tournament against a bunch of teams that play fully professional domestic leagues and all that so like like I said before the tournament I don't want Georgia to be in any way judged on any of their results this opportunity for them is an opportunity to see how to interact at a tier one level not how to compete at a tier one level this will only benefit them in terms of experience their players playing in this sort of tournament in the long run like they have to get experience of doing it before they can be in any way competitive like uh, but uh, yeah like Westy said with the set piece, it's it's a tough time for all us rugby spoofers like myself who'll be like, oh, Georgia, yeah, could they'll be good from the line out from the yeah, scrum yeah. because they're showing us all up for our lack of actual understanding. Uh, their scrum and their line out and their line out mode have been, been very poor the last two games, but a little bit better against Wales than they were against England. That's that's to be understood. <laughs> In Wales are a little bit worse than England. So. Yeah, but it hurts me to say it, but that's a that's a very young and experienced Wales team. So any of the positives you can say about Georgia, like they were still well and truly beaten by, yeah, by nowhere near Wales's theoretically strongest team. And what was uh, how how did Wales play? Any sign of a bit more synergy or a bit more togetherness than they did against Ireland? Uh, yeah, but again, look again, they're, they're playing against opposition that's not as together as when as we were. We are we were defensively quite decent against them, apart mm. from kind of maybe our discipline getting the better of us at times. Um, no, I think they were a bit better. They, they, I said they had a few. You know, Louis Rees Samet was brilliant. Um, well, I mean, not brilliant, but very exciting to see him on a ball. Um, a lot of their kind of I thought um, Jake Ball is fantastic second row. Uh, Tipperick was very good again. Um, it was good. I mean, I, th- I think the new lads they brought in were exciting, and then they had a couple of more experienced lads that kind of did a lot of hard work. So I think um, I, I, I don't want to say too much because I mean I do think they're going to get hockeyed by England next week. But um, it did seem to flow a bit better with the kind of younger crop of players. I think maybe for the sake of Wayne Pivac, maybe he's better to build with a younger squad than try and change the way his kind of more experienced lads are used to playing under under fifteen years of Gatlin. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. It's tough to break that, yeah, that, that culture, but um, very good. We'll move on to the last game then. Scotland, France. France come away 22 points, 15 victors. Um, a lot of positives to take this from Scotland, though. Like, f- they looked great in certain areas. They look, Scotland have really, in the last, whatever, year, year and a half, have really built something here and a bit of momentum. And they could have easily drawn this game. You never know. Stuart Hogg, obviously, quite a, 
a clanger at the end to kick the ball, keep the ball in touch without actually uh, getting the penalty for the for the line out. Um, France obviously without Intimac, which is you know Intimac down to um, I can never think of this guy's um, what the Jalibert. The, the Jalibert, yeah, I was thinking of Jailbird. That's that's how I <laughs> nearly remember Jalibert. Um, that's a bit of a step down, obviously, but Dupont was incredible. Vakatawa is always like th- if we could attack. 10% like France do sometimes I'm like we'd be so much better they're just they're incredible to watch going forward but you know again Scotland as I said a lot, a lot of positive to take away from this Sam yeah I think Scotland a lot of positive to take from the last couple of years they've definitely grown uh, they've, they've pulled away from Italy in terms of being down the bottom in a pair to it being noticeably like five teams and Italy in the Six Nations. Uh, I think Scotland, are, they're very competitive now in all the games they play. You know, they might not always win, but they're always going to put up a good fight. And they've got a lot of stars now. You know, they've got some really, really top drawer players uh, and depth, which is, you know, helped by the fact that Edinburgh have been quite good and that, so, that they don't stop their players going abroad, like the likes of Hog playing in England and stuff. It, that That's all been hugely beneficial to them. So, I'm like, I've been impressed with them. I think, They'll they'll be very annoyed that they didn't give it one last push with that whole mix up at the end with the hog with hog and stuff and the penalty. So, you know, they're they're in a, a great game against a really, really strong France team. So it's absolutely to be commended. Yeah, Westy, what did you think about that game? Yeah, I thought I thought it was good. I thought it was quite I mean it was very entertaining, especially the first half was very tit for tat in terms of the penalties. I I thought like in contrast to us who kind of tried to go for the corner each time, even when our line out wasn't working, like both teams kind of size up the other and knew they had to build points. Um, I think it's great for Scotland, you know, after beating them the last time to be so close and be so competitive for the whole game. It kind of puts anybody's kind of mind to, to rest if they're trying to think that, that they got some sort of fluke, that they caught France on a bad day, you know, back in, back in February or, or March, whatever it was. Um, and again, as you say, with, with like, you know, the Smurf anti Finn Russell campaign is really <laughs> catching fire here. Duncan Weir seems yes. to be the answer to the to Scotland's yeah. problems. Um, so yeah, look, I thought they were very strong. France, um, I do think France were deserved winners. I, like I've been banging on, but I'm not the only one. But I think Thomas Ramos is so exciting, ball in hand. Mm. Um, I think the only problem is they don't know when to have him kick or when to have Jali Bear kick or yeah. kick. Um, but yeah, no, I thought they were. I thought. I thought France were slightly deserved winners, although had Scotland got it in the last minute or even got the draw in the last minute, I think that would have been, I think anybody would have been unhappy with that as a representation of the game itself. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Italy, 28-0 winners against Fiji. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Huge, huge run of form for Italy. At the huge run of form. Yeah. <laughs> huge year, yeah. Uh, that's obviously what was cancelled. I'm so disappointed we're not getting to see Fiji play in this. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you know that the, the Fiji-Scotland match, for anyone who doesn't know, is already cancelled? Already yeah. cancelled, yeah. It's cancelled during the week because they've so on this on the websites T T B C. So they're just dangling a little bit of hope in front of you. You know, to be we don't know yet. We don't know. See, this, this is what I don't understand, right? Because last week they got the twenty eight nil victory. Uh, France got twenty eight nil victory against Fiji. Yeah. But as far as I can see, um, like, okay, no, sorry, they get twenty eight nil victory but Scotland is still CC so it's like why not just give them 28 points now like we know you're going to yeah, imagine them. if they didn't give Scotland 28 nil yeah. <laughs> it's like fuck you Scotland we don't give a fuck but I mean uh, on the other hand like we're going to see Fiji hopefully see Fiji play Georgia in two weeks time which you know but Fiji will probably win but could be a good game Fiji won't have had the match prep that they should have had yeah let's hope we do get to see that um, alright boys we'll, I think we'll wrap it up there because we're coming up to 50 minutes so um, thanks for joining us. We'll, we'll recap. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully, a, a very inexperienced, a very different team Ireland line out against Georgia because obviously that's what we want to see. Um, and we'll recap that uh, next week. So, boys, appreciate it as always, and we'll catch you next week. Bye. See you, see you boys.